Um, we're getting all the panelists settled up here, and I just want to take a moment to introduce Robin Blumner, who is the moderator of this panel this morning for us. Robin Blumner is the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, which makes her an awesome choice for moderating a panel on supporting science in lawmaking. Um, prior to that, she was a regular columnist for the Tampa Bay Times. And prior to that, she served as a executive director for two different state affiliates of the ACLU. First, the Utah affiliate, and then the Florida affiliate. So she has both executive directing experience, lawmaking, lobbying experience, and science experience, making her a fantastic, fantastic person to have moderating our panel. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Robin Blumner um, as the moderator of our Supporting Science and Lawmaking panel, and she is going to introduce our other panelists. Thank you so much. I'm kind of a newbie to the movement, arriving in February from uh, 16 years prior as a columnist and editorial writer with the Tampa Bay Times newspaper in Florida. But uh, in 2004, I wrote a column for the newspaper and it was titled, I'm an Atheist, So What? And so ever, ever since then, I've been sort of Florida's resident atheist, <laughs> which I wear proudly, of course. So reason and science are why, why we're here today. And as most of you know, scientific illiteracy is rampant in the United States, which contributes mightily to backward and skewed public policy. I said this yesterday, 46% of Americans tell pollsters that human beings arrived on this earth within the last 10,000 years fully formed. It's just, I mean, shockingly, aggressively ignorant. <laughs> we routinely elect politicians in the United States that, who say that the Earth is 6,000 years old because their religion tells them to. It tells them that this is true. And yet, we have almost no one elected to political office in the United States who openly rejects the supernatural and who says that they subscribe to an evidence-based view of the natural world. I mean, this is the 21st century. American competitiveness depends on science literacy and our ability to, to progress technologically. How can we do this with those kinds of shocking statistics? The result of all this is obvious and dangerous. Climate change denial is arresting action on the central problem of our age, even as the clock is ticking. We had a recent president, George W. Bush, who limited stem cell research because of his concern for the life of human embryos that could fit inside the brain of a fruit fly. Yeah. <laughs> We have a U.S. Senator, Marco Rubio of Florida, a man who has presidential aspirations, who refused to say in an interview with a magazine that the Earth is billions of, year, of years old. Why? Because he was afraid that it wouldn't play well at a Republican primary for president. <laughs> Still today, we have in this country public school biology teachers who will teach creationism, or at least dumb down evolution, so they don't get into trouble, so there's no controversy with the local school board. So, what do we do about it? Well, lucky, luckily we'll have the answer today. <laughs> because we have a group of preeminent experts to discuss, to discuss it. So let me introduce them in turn. They'll each have a few minutes to introduce themselves, their organizations, and then I will moderate a discussion for about a half hour, and then we'll open it up 
for about 20 more minutes to questions from you. So start thinking of your questions. All right, to my right is Angela Ledford Anderson, who is the Director of the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. To her right is Erin Keith, Associate, Associate Director of Government Relations at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And finally, we have Mercedes Gore, Executive Director of the Global, excuse me, it's Blavatnik, the Blavatnik Awards for Young Scientists at the New York Academy of Sciences. So let us begin with our to join you today. Um, I am uh, proud to work for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, we are not actually a union. Um, but we are uh, a, uh, a, a fabulous group of, of scientists and citizens who put rigorous science to work to solve our, nation, our planet's most pressing problems. Um, the group started as a, a alliance between faculty and students at MIT in 1969, and we now have over 400,000 uh, members and an uh, expert network of over 20,000, and we certainly invite you all to join. Um, I have the pleasure to direct the Climate and Energy Program at, at UCS. Uh, it's a very exciting program, um, and we're more all the time. I think we are at a critical moment when it comes to uh, climate change. Uh, lots of ups and downs, as those of you who have been following the issue know, but I think we're on an upward swing. Um, UCS actually pioneered the notion of the renewable energy standard at the state level. Um, there, they now exist in 29 states, and uh, we're promoting international solutions as well. We have a very exciting upcoming uh, decision moment in, uh, in Paris in uh, 2015 uh, to hopefully uh, come up with a new climate, uh, we'll call it treaty, but a new international climate agreement um, that will uh, really have the U.S. joining the world in uh, an commitment to reduce emissions. Uh, our role is to mobilize those citizens and science, uh, those citizen members and scientists to engage um, in those particular issues of the day and really bring uh, some really solid analysis. And, and one of the best things we do is, is translate the science for, uh, for citizen lo lobbyists like yourselves. And so we'll be doing a lot of that, particularly around the new EPA role, which I hope to talk to you about uh, as we get the Q&A. Thank you. Hi, I'm Erin Heath. I'm Associate Director of Government Relations at AAAS. Very happy to be here. Uh, AAAS is the world's largest general scientific society. We're very active in areas like science and policy, science education, science and national security, and science diplomacy, and we also publish the journal Science. Uh, what I do is uh, I work in the Government Relations Office. We essentially serve as the liaison between the government and the scientific world. So we try to educate members of Congress and their staffs and other members of government about science and uh, try to let scientists know what's going on in government. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mercedes Gora, and um, I'm happy to be here. I'm very excited. I've never been to a, a function like this before, so this is my first time. Um, I work at the New York Academy of Sciences. It's a very old institution. It's been around since 1817. Um, it is not really an academy, just like you know, uh, <laughs> union, um, in that uh, members aren't elected, uh, anyone can join. So um, our 22,000 uh, members are fans of science, as well as scientists and scientists of renown as well. Uh, Nobel laureates are um, on our board and, and advise us. The core mission is to advance scientific knowledge, um, promote science-based solutions to global problems, and to increase the number of uh, individuals in society that are scientifically informed. Um, so we have public programs that we run where we send graduate students and postdocs uh, to grade schools to show them that not all scientists look like Doc Brown from Back to the Future, but some of them are actually young and can speak uh, you know, normally um, in plain language and uh, make science fun. So that's one of the, the missions. My particular program, the Botanic Awards, um, is a new program, relatively new. And we are attempting to emulate the Nobel Prize, but we're giving prizes to scientists who are 42 years and younger. Um, and the reason for that 
is we'd like to make scientists famous when they can still relate to a lot of people, the public. Um, that we don't all have, you know, um, uh, their fame behind them and their discoveries decades ago, that their best work is still ahead of them. We'd like them to be um, the faces of science. So that's the mission of the award. Okay, well, thank you. So it's nice to see a bunch of ladies up here. <laughs> Because sadly, uh, now we can see them. Uh, they're observable, they're here, uh, and they're getting worse. Uh, so, so that, I think, is going to be the, the key over the long run. When it comes to politicians, uh, I, I think it's, it's sort of the same boat. Um, we are hoping to give uh, the, those politicians who do understand the facts and realities the pathway that they need uh, to be able to move uh, out of their the, the corner, essentially, that I think many of them have backed themselves into uh, during in, in this ideological fight over climate change, which is, is really quite ideological and, and not fact-based. Um, so I think I'm hopeful we're seeing that turn on. We can talk about where and how, but what the challenges still are. Um, I Agree absolutely with, with Angela and Aaron. Um, I, I also have to say that you know in scientific training, we're we're, on, we're told not to talk in anecdotes. We're, we're we're told that the way that you convey and convince someone is that you show them the data and they will be blown away by your beautiful slide. Um, it doesn't matter how you deliver it. That's all you need. Um, so we need to kind of readjust that and make scientists comfortable with the idea that that's how you, know, you deliver in this way, you deliver your message in this way, it's okay. You haven't betrayed your, your uh, peers, um, you know, you are, you are still using scientific language, but you're using it in a more effective way. And I think that's a message that, that we're learning more and more. I took the policy fellowship that AAAS runs, and this, this is one of the most life-changing things that I think I did because I was a scientist, I didn't know how to talk in that way. And then, you know, you, you get that training and you see an effect. So so I think that there are definitely steps that, and we are moving in the right direction. So yesterday, uh, four rather brave members of Congress came to address our group, which was a huge step forward in credibility and legitimacy for the secular movement. And uh, Senator Whitehouse, uh, focused in on, on climate change in his speech. And he was saying that uh, it wasn't so much driven by religion and religious dogma as by sort of the fossil fuel industry and using maybe that at the front to protect its, its um, pecuniary interests. 
Um, and I'm wondering whether that's also what you see in your lobbying efforts. Yes, and they've been unbelievably <laughs> effective. Um, the, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a book from by Naomi Oreskes it's called Merchants of Doubt. Yes. Um, she takes a look at the history of the tobacco industry and how uh, essentially sowing confusion was the key uh, to to their success and the fossil fuel industry you know sort of took that model and, and did it better uh, there's so and, it, and it's so ingrained now that it's almost hard to see um, there Senator Reid I think and Senator Whitehouse have been in, incredibly brave along with many of the other uh, uh, Democratic uh, folks uh, in unmasking the Koch brothers uh, and I got tickled uh, yesterday, after I saw their first ad. Um, they're now having to put out kind of branding ads of, you know, we are, we're good for industry and we're, because that their, their company has really been smeared by their political activity. Uh, not backing off any on the political activity, but um, I, I would say that they have really sought to uh, sow confusion and you see a lot of, and, and, but we are seeing, um, movement and, and I think what the, the, the joy was when the National Climate Assessment came out and we had all kinds of members of Congress instead of disputing the science saying, well, I'm no scientist, and we all went, yes, that's <laughs> so anyway, when there's time, if we have time in Q and A, we are doing some really interesting research that is going to connect the fossil fuel industry to the actual percentage of global greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere today. Um, uh, a good friend of ours, Rick Keedy, with the Climate Accountability Institute, has documented the 90 entities, um, about 13, 14 of which are investor-owned companies, mostly based in the U.S. Um, that are responsible for two-thirds of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere today. And the science of how do you attribute specific impacts or uh, the specific degrees of uh, global average temperature increase has grown so much that we're going, we're going to be to the point soon where we can say uh, ExxonMobil's Chevron Shell brought you X percent of global warming. Um, and, and I think that's going to really be the first is on a tear now, at least the House, to uh, redirect quite a bit of federal money towards um, underwriting private school education. Is it, might the scientific world understand that they have common cause in preventing that kind of thing from happening with the, with the secular world as well? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I, what I generally say to these kind of questions is um, the, the way to get at this is, is to get engaged. And I do a lot of work um, to try to help get the resources out there for scientists to get engaged with policymakers, with the media, with the public um, in terms of these uh, in terms of education issues. Um, run for school board. Uh, that's one amazing way to to get involved. Um, sometimes it's starting a teacher education program. We're finding that. Um, a lot of teachers don't teach evolution uh, because they're not comfortable with it. They're not. They're, they're worried about leading into the controversy. Uh, so now there are workshops all over the country to try to, to alleviate that. Um, and the other thing, and we, as I said, we do reach out to evangelical communities. And um, I don't know how that's going to play here, but I think that's a very important piece. We have to have a dialogue with those communities. Well, what do you do? I mean, how do you reach out? Where's your common cause? 
So in our case, we have a program called the Di Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. And so we, uh, we have partnerships with uh, the Nas National Association of Evangelicals. Um, we also have a program to try to get uh, science education into seminaries. Um, and we do a lot of public education events and surveys, like the one I mentioned before. So that's how, that's how we get at it. And what kind of success rate have you had? You know, success it is hard to measure. And, you know, <laughs> obviously, these bills are still out there, these bills that challenge science education in the states. Um, so, but I, but I do think that uh, it, it does seem that we're making inroads, and we need to continue that. Anyone else want to talk about the having to step beyond science and larger public policy and in issues that will impact scientific literacy? I mean, I have, I have a, maybe a couple of examples of this. So we, um, at the academy that I mentioned before, is we have a, a mentorship program. Um, and we, we kind of, we call it the STEM pipeline. So we um, encourage uh, graduate students and, and postdocs, people still early in their careers, scientists, to go into schools, and, and the program is public school, right? um, to act as mentors. And they often advise on science projects and things like that. Now, um, this is the first exposure that they have to current, you know, the current state of science education, usually. Um, what we have been seeing, though, with as they've gone through their careers, um, and they then have children of their own, and they are making decisions about where to send their kids, um, it's it, they start to question whether the you know the public school system is enough. So those kinds of issues where it, it does hit them personally. So you know I think maybe beyond just. You know, as a role model in society, as a scientist, I should you know weigh in on, on education policy. I think in a lot of we have to remember that scientists are we are people too, and um, and and the things that will get them to take that extra step usually is something that's it's a little bit more personal. I, have, I mean, just from my you know observation, you know, amongst my peers and and, and my community. So it, I I don't know I know that doesn't quite answer your question, but I, I kind of feel like if, if there is at least amongst the people that I know, that you know, that kind of um, activism or that kind of attention gets paid when it's relevant to themselves. So why do you think, you know, 90 years or so after the Scopes Monkey Trial, <laughs> we still have such a huge proportion of, of Americans that don't believe in, a, in a human evolution, at least. Where does that come from? Okay, what can you do about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, I, I hate to, to put it on scientists because, um, but <laughs> we we like we exist in an echo chamber often. Um, we, as I mentioned before, we get trained to talk to each other, not to people outside of our. I can't. Eat, I'm a biologist. I keep, I have a hard time talking to a physicist. So it's not even you know a, a question of taking the next step and being able to talk to someone who isn't scientifically trained. Um, I think that more of an effort to have scientists who are capable, who are willing and able to do this well. Um, you know, you have the Neil deGrasse Tyson's and the, and the, and the uh, Brian Reed. So you and have Richard Dawkins. And the Richard Dawkins. I saw him talking, that was one of the first science communicator type things that I'd seen with Caltech and it was, it was actually, it's, that was a long time ago, and I still remember that part. <laughs> and, but, but, and I, I just had this conversation with with, an, with a Nobel Prize winner, who, and I said, "What is what is our problem? Why can't we get? Why do we have such a high um, percentage of, of Americans who still um, don't believe in evolution?" And he said, "Well, look what we've done to the people that are the communicators. It's just recently that we've started to look at them and say." These are people that scientifically that we should emulate. In the past, we've said, well, yeah, they're kind of pop scientists. <laughs> the real scientists are the ones getting the Nobel Prize. You don't see them standing in front of podiums and at a pub and trying to deliver <coughs> science. That's we're seeing a difference now. We're starting to see the value of being a good communicator, and in addition to being a top scientist. Um, I, I, so I do think that that's part of it. We need to not be 
so happy with just being so alien in this, in this society. We need to look and talk like other people so that, so that people can hear our messages and, and, and believe us and not think that we're in Monsanto's pocket and not think that we're in Wyatt's pocket. It's, it's, there are things that are now part of being a professional scientist, and that's just the reality of it. So that's me on my soapbox. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree. Um, and I, I will also say that uh, a lot of the bills that we see challenging evolution education or climate education are driven by a handful of individuals, maybe even one individual. And, and these people are very passionate. Honestly, we probably can't persuade them. But it does leave, I think, I'd like to think, a, a large portion of the population that, that, that could possibly be persuaded if, if, we, if we reach them. So I'm not a scientist, um, unless you think politics is a science, which is debatable. Um, I, I just think that there have been, if you look back on history, there's been periods of anti-intellectualism, and it tracks um, uh, our economic situation. And so I think uh, when we're in a period right now, if you look, I, this is purely a theory, but I think the income inequality um, that we're looking at the country and the widening gap um, means that those folks on the lower end of the spectrum, um, there's, uh, and Dan Kahan does a marvelous job at Princeton of, of talking about this, there's a tribalism that has grown up in our society that contributes to our, uh, the, the, uh, the polarization of communication and of politics. And I think there's just a, a, a real fear of intellectuals and elites. Uh, and, and you combine that with what has not been the greatest uh, education system in the world, and you end up with, uh, it's easy to just grab onto what you hear your pastor say or to various movements that make you feel comfortable, included, um, and, and hopeful. And so I agree that we can do a better job of uh, communicating science uh, in, in to, to folks with those values, and I think we've learned a lot of those lessons. And um, but but I think it is tight. It is not. You can't look at the issue in a vacuum. I think there's a lot of other things going on societally that's contributing to that phenomenon. Okay. That's a good. Answer. Thank you. Uh, all of you. So I'm interested to know what the premier issue is. That you're, that you're grappling with. Now, of course, for you, it's climate change. Uh, you can talk a little more about that and how, you, how you're going about it. But I'd like each of you to talk about the, the issue that's on your front burner right now. So I can go a little deep. So on climate change, right, we have some immediate opportunities. So we want to seize those. And one is, you know, the first ever regulation of uh, carbon dioxide from power plants was released by uh, Gina McCarthy last week. Candidly, I mean, we, we're so, it, it's going to be a long slog to, to get it implemented, uh, or to, to, to make sure it stands, to get the states to implement it, uh, et cetera. So, uh, and uh, we're not done yet. We need to strengthen it. It can be and will be stronger. So that's the opportunity side. I think the other, uh, the thing that keeps us up nice uh, is that you know, the, the, the prevailing theory around global warming has been that what we needed to do to, to avert the worst consequences of climate change is to stay below uh, a global average temperature temperature degree of two degrees, and we are at 1.6, uh, and emissions keep rising, uh, even with these sorts of impacts and with uh, you know some tremendous uh, strides in some of the developing countries and in Europe. Uh, so the then uh, now uh, our, our chief scientist, Peter Fromhoff, offered a, uh, authored a paper a few weeks ago that, uh, that really said, it's time for us to take a look at this in a new framework. Our, our traditional uh, just push harder for new policies to produce and reduce as fast, let's get on a war footing, and all the things that all of us activists have said are still possible. And really, it's between 2020 and 2030 that's going to save the day, that's going to see where, where we end up, basically. So we still have time. But it, the, the big science debates we're having to open up and think about are, uh, are what do you do about adaptation? What do we do about the consequences we can't avoid anymore that are locked in? 
uh, what do we, should, how do we look at and think about geoengineering, which has so many potential adverse uh, impacts in itself? Is it what kind of trade-offs are we uh, going to have to wrestle with now, given uh, our failure to act sooner? So those are some of the the internal uh, uh, discussions that that we have in terms of how do we stay science-based and cutting edge uh, to in really tackle the problem. So on the subject of climate, AAAS just recently came out with a report called What We Know, which essentially says what we do know about climate change. And one of the things from the report that struck me was uh, 1.6 degrees might not seem like a lot, but if your child has a temperature that goes up 1.6 degrees, you worry. So think of it like the human body. Uh, in terms of in the issues that I deal with, you know, I, I do handle the uh, evolution and climate education of the states issue. It crops up particularly every spring, and uh, these bills, as I said, just do not go away. Um, they've changed over the years. I think, as you said, it's been 90 years since evolution's been challenged in a high-profile way. Um, since the Dover tri trial in 2005, it, it was ruled that intelligent design is unconstitutional in, in the science classroom. So uh, the recent bills, um, the most common are the so-called academic freedom bills. And these will encourage teachers to have their students analyze and critique certain scientific theories and look at what they call the scientific strengths and scientific weaknesses. Uh, we don't think evolution's been a particularly weak theory, but okay. Um, <laughs> so um, in the beginning, these bills would often single out evolution. Um, increasingly, they have added climate change to the mix. Uh, or they don't single out anything, but, um, but that is still the intention. Uh, and climate has really, I think, kind of erupted as a point of challenge in recent years. So that's something that I think will continue to grow. So I'm worried about this. I'm asleep over this. So, um, the main thing that my program focuses on, or the main issue that we look at, is um, science funding. And on top of just um, this particular environmental research that has been happening over the past decade, um, the recent uh, challenge to the peer review system at NSF um, has been particularly worrisome <laughs> for, for scientists. And this idea that, uh, that Congress should be able to impose um, standards on what is good science and what is not. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if I've seen something like that before, um, certainly during my lifetime. Um, but, it, and it looks like it has some serious support. Um, I, I, I'm, I think that's the last I looked at it was a couple months ago. But um, it, it's something that we don't know what to do with at this point, I think. Um, because it, it does have the sense of, um, well, there's, if, if we do a su support, if we're, if we're advocating for funding um, and the increase in funding, but it comes with all of these ties, um, you know, what are we faced with then? Do we then say, you know, we're going to find other ways to, to fund our work? Um, the the awards program that I run is, is a program that gives funding unrestricted to the individual scientists. We don't even give it to the institution, we actually give it to the individual. Um, just because we don't want them to be faced with having to make a decision about what it is that they're going to pursue um, based on the politics of even the, their institution. Um, it, it's, it's a small thing in the bigger, you know, in, in, in the bigger scheme because there are a lot of scientists out there who are imperiled by this kind of legislation, but, um, but that's certainly something. Okay, and on that note, I think I'll open it up to the audience for questions. How about this? Whoever has the microphone wins. <laughs> uh, we'll, let, we'll let the microphone come around, and wherever it lands, that's who. So one thing that is apparent to me is that we have been attacked by the other side, by the right-wingers, for a long time of saying, you know, we're skeptical of this, da, da, da. And what I would wonder is, is it valuable to, instead of being on, you know, pushed back onto our hind foot, to attack them and say, you know, I take your attack of, of, uh, of global warming science the same way 
that I look at the science of cigarette uh, uh, tobacco love and with the same result. And you know, and, and, and challenge them on saying, this is in your financial best interest, that's why you're arguing for it. And then also say, and what if you're wrong? You know, because that's something that we get all the time on this God thing. <laughs> but why not go for it on the science? Because what if they're wrong? It's really awful. I don't know that I would use the word attack. Um, I would say I would say speak up. I, I think, as, as I've said, you know, the, the key is to get engaged, mm -hmm. to tell these stories, uh, and to get in. And there are many, many ways to, to get engaged. You're all here, so you're already engaged, which is great. Um, I applaud you all. Um, and, and this is just one way coming to DC. Um, you can also get involved locally, as I said. Um, run for school board, or just write a letter to the editor of the local paper. I mean, there are many, many ways to do this. Um, but you don't think the challenge is the Way to go? Well, as I said, I'm a pretty strong believer in trying to find it on the ground. I think that's the way to go. I know people disagree with me, um, but that's the way AAAS approaches it. It seems that a lot of my mind is. Speak into the mic, please. Yeah, I don't think it's working for me either. Oh, that's pretty nice. I was yelling. Okay. <laughs> Do we not have a mic? Um, thank you. Go through slides. Okay, why don't we just speak up? Speak up. Repeat okay. the question. Um, it seems that a lot of the reasons that we have such kind of reactionary um, members of Congress is that they're in safe districts that are, you know, that kind of thing. Because of gerrymandering, I was wondering if uh, anyone is working on uh, a more scientific, uh, fair, nonpartisan way of, of un-gerrymandering districts that could be pushed by scientists because it would have uh, a positive effect in, in maybe getting more reasonable people um, <laughs> into office. I was wondering if there are any, if there are any groups working on that or, or yeah. Bravo, great idea. I like that. It's so funny you say that. Um, we were just on a staff retreat and on the way home. Can you repeat I, what the person said? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, of course. Um, uh, he was mentioning the fact that part of the reason we have such, uh, uh, in his words, reactionary members of Congress uh, is because they're in safe districts. Uh, and the safe districts are largely uh, a result of uh, gerrymandering and, and we didn't do. Uh, and is there, is anyone studying uh, a more science-based uh, method of, uh, of redistricting? So uh, the, I don't know if anyone else is doing it, but it's a great question. And uh, we were just discussing on the way back from our retreat, uh, we have, UCS created about two years ago the Center for Science and Democracy. And uh, at one point, uh, the three of my staff turned around, they were discussing with Michelle, and they said, don't you think the Center for Science and Democracy ought to take up redistricting? Yeah, the yeah. 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 So now I can say that I heard this from uh, 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 from you all in the crowd, and it's not just my staff trying to push work on somebody else's program. Uh, but we will be happily. I, I think it's a terrific idea. I think there's probably lots of groups and. and uh, and we do a lot on science and science, how science should affect policy making, but we're a little light on the democracy side. So I think it's a really terrific idea. Yeah. All right, um, you, you, <laughs> sorry, like, I can't see name tags right now. And because we're having my problems, I'm just gonna stand by the person who's speaking <laughs> now. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Mercedes, my question to you is, you mentioned that facts don't change minds all the time. That was Aaron. Or that was but I agree with that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize. I agree with that. So when, when we speak about facts and scientific facts, one of the experiences I had yesterday in speaking with regards to climate change to the legislative analyst was that the science is still out. The, their science hasn't proven because of this 3%. You know, 97% of scientists agree that climate, is, climate change is happening, there's a human cause. How do we discredit that 3% and get the general public that has a lack of critical thinking skills, 
understanding for true peer-reviewed science to come to that conclusion that this is BS and this is really what matters. How, how do we help that as individuals? What can we do to, to foster that? Because, or, or what should we do? So, I know that's a big question. No, I, it's, it's a good question. It's a great question. It's something that, that actually we, we do struggle with because any scientist will tell, well, no, no one, no self-respecting scientist will ever say 100% certainty about anything. Mm -hmm. um, we, 97% is great. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're we, we pass drugs based on way less than that. And that's you don't have, you know, statistical so. significance, and I don't think people understand. I come from a healthcare background. I understand, you know, statistical significance and probabilities, but there's many individuals that don't have the knowledge or understanding of, of science and critical thinking to understand that when you have that kind of statistical significance, it it makes a difference. And how do we get that to to people by oh, one thing I'll say, and I was a journalism major way back when and when I was in J school, it was drilled into us to tell both sides of the story. Yeah. Tell the story. Yeah. Uh, and then you get to the real world and you find that there aren't always really two sides to every story. Um, and I, I feel like when I first started following uh, the issue of education, I would see articles which gave equal time to both evolution and intelligent design, but that wasn't the reality that the science was reflecting. I feel like I'm seeing that less now, and so I think you know, reaching out to the media is just one way to get at this. And we actually, AAAS has a mass media fellows program in which we bring scientists uh, to work at newspapers and magazines and other media outlets uh, for a summer. And I think that's, you know, that's one way to approach it, to actually get scientists in the door at those, at those media outlets. So, uh, I was trained as an activist and uh, a how to spin journalist, so uh, <laughs> we, we learned the art of pivoting. Uh, and I think when someone comes at you with the 97, you know, with the 3%, it's not proven, uh, you can very quickly say, you know, it, with all due respect, uh, Congressional LA, uh, your boss makes decisions on far weaker science than that uh, all the time. Um, what's really at, at, at issue here is, are you going to protect your constituents from the impacts that are here and getting worse? And so that pivot into a frame that makes them responsible for uh, dealing with the results of that science is, is the thing that we are, are trying to do improve upon and working with local officials to do more of emergency responders um, really get those folks that that they can't ignore uh, and, and using again those experiences the the, the the data of what's really happening not so much the theory of climate change it's on you. great thank you my name is Gleb Saborski and thank you for the panel and the presentation this is, I think this is great and I especially appreciate the last comment, the last conversation about how do you get actually people to engage in critical thinking. And everything that I've heard here has been really terrific on pointing out the benefits of critical thinking on this broader social level. Um, something that I'm passionate about, and uh, I actually co-founded a nonprofit uh, devoted to teaching people how to think critically on an individual level. So pointing out to them the benefits of critical thinking in their individual lives. And how do you actually think probabilistically about events that occur? How do you think using reason-based evidence on an individual level? And that's something I haven't heard in the conversation yet. I think it's something that may be missing in the broader secular movement. If you tie people's individual decision-making to scientific thinking, probabilistic thinking, evidence-based thinking, they will inevitably apply that to society in general. So, can you talk a little bit about that level of education? What do you think about this um, kind of engagement of getting people on an individual level to think about, to think in an evidence-based fashion? And uh, I can talk a little bit about my work in this fashion as a professional educator, I'm a professor at uh, uh, so, 
Yeah, I was just kind of curious what you think about this time of society to the individual. In order to achieve that kind of level, so I'm married to an analytical philosopher. And we talk, and, um, and uh, you know, we try to compete about who can be more literal than that. <laughs> but um, it it does take, I think, um, the teaching that way of, of being. Right? That's not just thinking; it's just being. Is I think that's a combination of education. I think it's a combination of your who, how you're raised, yeah. like what your priorities are. Um, if if you have, I, I am amazed at how um, many gadgets one child can have going at one time. <laughs> um, and I I'm, I would be shocked if there was any kind of critical thinking going on aside from hitting that pig with that bird or whatever that is. Uh, you know that that so. I, I think there's there's something kind of culturally that needs to happen. I, I'm, you know, I, I don't know because that I, that seems like a really lofty kind of cult. Let's let me just follow up for a second. Sure. The, so, of course, leaders matter, right? In any culture. Absolutely. And do you do you think demanding more crit critical thinking of our politicians? might be a start towards modeling behavior for the rest of us? I would love to see that. <laughs> I mean, you know, so Rush Holt was kind of our, our AAAS policy hero. He, he was a, a fellow and, and he thought, gosh, if, if Congress were full of Rush Holt, we, we'd be in a much better place. Um, but, you know, can we put can we populate Congress with, with <coughs> across the board? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's up to you guys. I think. So. Thank you. Hi. Um, one of the most useful classes I took in my engineering curriculum was an advanced public speaking course, and that has helped me greatly explaining recurrent flooding and sea level rise down in coastal Virginia, where we're getting hammered, Norfolk especially. Um, my question for the panel is, what would you recommend to help create the next Neil deGrasse Tyson? Somebody who makes science more interesting, more digestible to, to the community at all. So was this, was this course an elective or a requirement? <laughs> uh, I, I took it. So that's, that's, I think, the issue. I, I really love to see more uh, communications training and integrated into our science and engineering programs. I think that would go a long way. Um, I, I think I mentioned it before. There's also this needs to be kind of a shift in values within science as a discipline itself and not looking at, um, you know, it's not just how do you write a grant application or how do you write an abstract. Um, by the way, you are seeing a little bit more of, so there are um, journals now, scientific journals, that are requiring scientists to write a lay version of their abstract. Oh, wow. I don't These are not, you know, these are well-respected, terrific journals. So, so certainly the, that message that um, scientists who want to be, uh, you know, responsible members of the profession need to know how to be good communicators. And if that were in the curriculum, that would be a great message. Bravo, yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nana Kate, and I work for American Atheist in New Jersey, which um, in the near future will be under a lot of water. Um, one of the things that we found yesterday when we were lobbying that I found is that uh, members of Congress and even senators want specifics for their state so they can, you know, if they're going to do legislation, you all seem like wonderful resources yourselves as well as your organizations, and I'm hoping that this means that the SCA and our member organizations will get to have stronger communication. Are there specific things that we can go to your organizations and get statistics, like how the poor will be um, disproportionately affected or minorities or our states, so that we can take those numbers and that information back? Because just as a lay person, when you go to the internet, it is hard to find that information. So I think that's a great point. Um, we are uh, 
we don't have it yet, uh, but we are putting together a series of state fact sheets that will have the best data we can find, state specific. A big part of the problem is a, a scientific one in that the impacts of climate change have been measured on a much broader scale than that, and getting actually downscale uh, projections to you know a state level. If the national climate assessment was done regionally, and there's it is in part because of the state of the science, but it is getting better, um, and NOAA is doing more and more downscale research. So uh, it's actually quite a task to get it down to state or a God forbid congressional district, which is really what they want, right? If you're logging the house. Uh, but we are going to move that and get we probably do around 12 states the, this coming year and, and more the following year. But we're finding exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. do, do any scientific groups do congressional scorecards? Right. <gasps> yes. Wow. Yes. Society for Neuroscience. Yeah. I think they do scorecards. Overall, for science, not just for particular um, I know that they comment on how various members of Congress vote on neuroscience and like funding of NIH is issues. I don't know about global science. But I'm just saying it would seem to me that would be helpful for for lay lobbyists. Can we request that as a goal? <laughs> it is to an extent, but you know, from my perspective, scorecards are kind of a mixed bag, right? But I mean, part of our job is to try to reach out to these members of Congress um, who aren't on the science champions. Um, and so if we're giving them an F grade, they're not going really to be open to even talking to us. So, so that's just something to consider when you're, you're talking about the scorecard idea. All right, um, just really quick. We're going to get a question from Chandler and then one more question before we allow Robin to wrap up the panel. Uh, good morning. I am, um, I'm a guest here and not a member, so I apologize if I'm inappropriate. It, I'm engaged in a product, in a, in a project, I'm real nervous. I'm engaged in a project that promotes critical thinking. I get emails from Aaron, I get emails from the young lady on the right, always asking for money. I apologize, I've never returned those mails. <laughs> and so I get asked to a lot of gigs like this. Kelly asked me how I got here. I really couldn't answer her, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to say thank you so much, because last month, um, in April actually, I went to a gig for STEM, the culture of STEM, and the panel was all middle-aged white males. <laughs> this is a fabulous, event and I just wanted to acknowledge the power to be for a fabulous event. Thank you. Okay, so the final question, right? Okay, I'm uh, sorry I I had to step out for a while, so hopefully this isn't repetitive. But uh, apropos of the, the recent couple of questions, there are organizations like the League of Conservation Voters that do do congressional scorecards. And you can look up your representatives and senators on all kinds of issues related to the environment, including climate change and how people have voted. So that's one resource. And they also have reports and things that are sometimes more accessible to people that don't have a lot of scientific training. Do you want to make a final question? <laughs> 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 we have so many calls to Okay. And I will be very brief. I thank you. You're awesome. Um, can you give those of us uh, parents, in particular, who would like to raise the next little Neils, um, any resources that we can take to our schools and or our school boards to help to make our aim something that's tangible and that we can actually do. Websites are good, please, thank you. So, uh, AAAS has something called Project 2061 that focuses on science literacy, and it's uh, it lists benchmarks of science literacy. I think that would be a great resource to, to yeah. check out. Um, they were involved in the Next Generation Science Standards. Okay, well, I want to thank very much our eminent panelists Angela, Aaron, and Mercedes. This was incredibly illuminating, and thank you for being here.